This is one of the three governor-led task forces, and we're delighted to be here. We'll have some time, plenty of time for questions, and this, this is an interesting area, and the more you get into it, the more unknowns, and we're hoping that you three gentlemen will be able to provide us with some, some information or some uh, predictions for the future of, of how this is going to work. There's questions about the government incentives against the, as opposed to the free market, the mom and pop stores and the homes that as opposed to QT and Bucky's and big places like that and on the home and it road and how long does it take and how much the adapters cost and what's going to be standardized and what isn't. In, in South Carolina, we are Volvo, we have a Volvo plant and they're planning to go all electric by uh, 2025 and BMW is planning to go all electric by 2030. Well, Proterra is making uh, school buses up in Greenville and we are uh, we are very much interested in South Carolina and in, in this this area, and I know the the whole country is because there's a there's a lot of interest in it at, at the national level. And as I, I would like to turn it over to to Governor Cooper to introduce our our guests and also make some comments. But I got one question for you. Now, Roy Cooper and I've been friends for a long time because we were attorneys general together over a number of years. He's from North Carolina, I'm from South Carolina, but I want to, is it, now to make it easy, is it true and true or false in the Duke mayonnaise bowl that South Carolina defeated North Carolina 38 to 21? Do you have any, any response to that intriguing question? That reminds me, uh, Governor McMaster, of the time you traveled to Raleigh to sue me uh, <laughs> one time and, well, and delivered the papers yourself. So. <laughs> Yeah, that was a little embarrassing. <laughs> we're, we're ready for some basketball now. All right, that's fine. Well, so, uh, am I going to go, or are we going to have uh, Governor Bashir first? Let's let Andy Bashir, yeah. all I've direct from Kentucky, Governor. Hey, thank you so much, and certainly, the um, University of Kentucky always enjoys playing South Carolina. Uh, it's been a good couple of years, but uh, I uh, wanted to thank everybody for having me virtually today. Uh, a family situation kept me from being there, but this is such an exciting topic, and we are seeing such uh, energy uh, across the country um, and, and truly a revolutionary or evolutionary time in the automobile uh, industry. Uh, we've been blessed here in Kentucky to have announcements ranging from Ford and SK Innovations, $6 billion dollar 5,000 job uh, Blue Oval Battery Park to Toyota, investing almost a half a billion dollars in the first uh, U.S. plant they ever built uh, in Georgetown, Kentucky, uh, happened in the late 80s, and still uh, we are thrilled, an important part of not only the present, uh, but the future. I think we're all also seeing different ones of our existing uh, companies impacted, uh, altering course or, or making changes. We had Firestone in Whitley County, an area that hadn't added a whole lot of jobs uh, in a while, adding more than 250 new workers, uh, and certainly so many uh, new companies locating as we try to build out a battery supply chain. Uh, it's pretty exciting uh, to, to think about what the future will be, but I know it's also pretty daunting in that we've got to build this airplane or, or this vehicle. Um, uh, while we're flying or driving it, and we've got to make sure that it can get charged as it moves uh, across the United States. What I believe is this is the inevitable step, and we are moving towards it, and we are moving quickly, and our goal, I think, as governors is how we can partner with this industry, knowing where we're going, to promote as much investment and job growth as possible, uh, while also to ensure that our citizens who want to drive these cars, the waiting list for some of these are just uh, huge, uh, are able to, to do so and to ultimately get around the country. Uh, again, I'm sorry I couldn't be there for the Q&A directly, uh, but you have the better looking uh, uh, Southern governor in Roy Cooper. I've been jealous of his hair for years. Thank you all. Thank you, Governor. Governor Roy Cooper, if you please. Southern governors are teaming up on me today. I, I, I want to thank uh, Governor Bashir and Governor McMaster for your work on this task force. It's quite timely, and we've appreciated it deeply. We've got some guests here who are experts in this arena, but I, I just wanted to say that in North Carolina, 
we are bringing bipartisan efforts together to fight climate change because that fight is going to put money in people's pockets. And it's, it's something that's coming at us fast. And so why don't we get on the leading edge of it in order to be able to prosper and create good paying jobs? Uh, I issued Executive Order 80 in 2018 that uh, asked the power sector to significantly reduce carbon emissions 70% by 2030 and to get to carbon zero by 2050. The legislature came and, and made that executive order law, essentially with the passage of North Carolina House Bill 951, putting those requirements in place for our utilities. Uh, we are now turning to the transportation sector to make it cleaner and to help us meet our statewide emission goals uh, with the executive order I have just issued uh, trying to get us a 50% economy-wide reduction in carbon emissions by 2030 and carbon zero by 2050. And one of the ways to do that is to get us to electric vehicles faster. But in so doing, we will be creating jobs and we will be wanting to make it as equitable and affordable as possible and we know we all have to make some hard decisions about how we're going to fund transportation because gas tax is going like this as we move more to electric vehicles. And we've got to have those hard conversations about how we're going to fund transportation as we eliminate the gas tax. Uh, my last executive order uh, envisions North Carolina to have 1.25 million electric vehicles on our road by 2030 and to have at least 50% of our sales by 2030 be electric vehicles. But we know that we can't get there without the infrastructure. And I'm looking forward to the federal investments that we're going to be making. Uh, North Carolina is using uh, some of its VW settlement money to do this. Duke Energy has gotten approval uh, for some money with the Utilities Commission to make those investments. So we've got to coordinate it in order for us to get to the future of electric vehicles, which is coming at us. We need to control it, and we need to make sure that uh, we are reaching the goals that, that we have set. So we've got experts here today that I'm delighted to introduce. We have Tom Stricker, the Vice President of Sustainability and Regulatory Affairs of Toyota North America. Uh, North Carolina is excited to be the first site for Toyota's electric vehicle battery plant in, in North America, and they'll be coming to the triad, the Greensboro area, uh, and we're excited about having them. Uh, we also have Travis Hester, who is the chief electric vehicle officer of GM. Uh, we have a GM factory in North Carolina making military vehicles, and we're delighted to have them in our state and the jobs that it creates. We're also going to have uh, John Bazella, who's the president and CEO of Alliance for Automotive Inno Innovation. So we welcome you guys to, to this panel. And uh, Tom Stricker, we'll have you start off and then uh, follow suit here. Excellent. All right. OK. So. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, really wonderful to be here today. And when I when I say it's wonderful to be here today, I literally mean it is wonderful to be here today and not at my house. And of course, we do have uh, one participant in that forum right now. But um, uh, thanks, Governor Pastor, and uh, thank you, Governor Cooper, for hosting the session today. And uh, Governor. I'm a little proud of the mic. Governor Bashir, uh, thank you as well for uh, for joining us uh, remotely. Um, the last session, uh, Senator Buda, is it possible to use somebody else's mic? You want to come over here? I think this one. Yeah, they bring them one. All right, hopefully this works a little better. OK, it sounds better. At the last section, uh, when talking about vehicles, Secretary Buttigieg used the term um, supercharge. That we, you know, we're going to supercharge the efforts. And uh, Governor Whitmer herself used the word uh, turbocharged. And 
Is it working? Okay. Hello. All right. I'm Tom Stricker with Toyota. And uh, all right. So uh, they use the words turbocharged and uh, and um, supercharged. And I think given where the industry is headed and where the market seems to be headed here, we need to start using the term amped up, I think is a, maybe a better uh, way to go. A lot has changed. Um, you know, in a very short amount of time, and uh, particularly in the space of electrification. So uh, plug-in hybrid and battery electric vehicle sales in 2021 doubled uh, from the prior year and now stand nationally at least at a 4% market share. And OEMs, including the ones at this table and others, have made numerous announcements around where we see our companies going, our investments going, uh, around carbon neutral and electrification into the 2030s and 2040 timeframe. Uh, the industry largely stood up in support of uh, the Biden administration's goal of 40 to 50 percent electrification by the end of the decade. Uh, so a lot has been changing, and obviously we've had to change with that too. Um, our president, Akio Toyota, announced back in December some new targets for our company going forward, and they nearly doubled the targets that we were talking about just three and a half years ago. So uh, by uh, on the vehicle side, um, he announced that we will be have we will uh, strive for eight million electrified vehicle sales by 2030. And we say electrified, that means hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and battery electric vehicles, and hydrogen fuel cells. So eight million electrified vehicles by 2030 on a global basis, and uh, three and a half million of those as battery electric vehicles. And our Lexus brand, he also announced, would be 100% battery electric sales here in North America by 2030 and in some other major markets uh, around the world. So in order to support those, uh, those goals, uh, we're investing heavily, and the whole industry is, of course. On the vehicle side, we've announced that we're going to be investing $70 billion in electrified vehicle development. Uh, between now and 2030, and $35 billion of that, or half of it basically, on battery electric vehicles. Um, right across the street at the DC Auto Show, we unveiled last week here on the East Coast for the first time the BZ4X, which is a Toyota SUV, 250-mile uh, range. Our first, well, it's not really our first battery electric vehicle in the U.S. We, we did it in the late 90s with the RAV4 and in the early 2010s with the RAV4 a second time. But in the latest incarnation of the uh, electrification movement, uh, it represents our, our next uh, major product milestone um, uh, coming here in April of this year in the United States. So on the battery side, uh, as Governor uh, Cooper alluded to, and, and thank you very much for the, the great uh, collaboration uh, in your state on our plant, we're going to be investing $13.5 billion on a global basis on uh, battery development. So about $3.5 billion of that here in the U.S. And of course, the down payment is our, our effort in North Carolina, uh, about a $1.3 billion uh, investment in a battery plant there. Um, BEV is clearly, battery electric vehicles are clearly prominent in our future plans, but we will also continue to lead in hybrid electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as we've done for the past two decades. Last year, a full 25% of our sales here in North America were hybrid electric vehicles, about 580,000 vehicles worth. So why does Toyota continue to pursue multiple pathways? Um, the answer is simple, it's carbon reduction. Uh, the goal demands that we pursue multiple options. People get caught up in comparing technologies. I think it's a societal thing as Americans. We, we like clear winners and we like clear losers. You see a lot of analysis and studies. The, you know, the average BEV on the average grid driving the average commute is better than the average plug-in hybrid, which is better than the average this, which is better than the average that. Um, all of those studies have a lot of merit um, because we, we need something to digest around and, and understand. But they also sort of miss the point, and that is that people aren't average, <laughs> right? There's, there's 320 million of us here in this country and 270, 280 million vehicles. Uh, no one driver is really average. There's, there's different driving patterns. We use different vehicle types. We all have different access to charging. The grids in the areas where we live have different emissions profiles. Uh, the carbon that goes into producing the different vehicles have, have different profiles as well. All of this affects the overall um, uh, understanding of which, vehicle can, which vehicles can reduce carbon the most. Um, 
And there is some growing evidence, um, some internal research we've done at our Toyota Research Institute North America, but also, um, which could be viewed as biased, but also MIT and some others, uh, who have you know done similar studies and found that depending on the circumstances that an individual driver faces, the lowest carbon option is often a battery electric vehicle. And of course, why we're all moving in that direction. But it's not always the optimal choice, just depending on a lot of these factors. So that's that's one of the reasons why we continue to want to um, have multiple options out there. It's also important to keep in mind affordability. So 25% of vehicle sales in the US last year were under $30,000. 25% were also over $50,000. And then the rest, of course, were in the middle. A portfolio approach allows us to offer low carbon solutions to a lot more people based on affordability and different vehicle types. Um, and you know that allows people, regardless of their income, regardless of sort of their status, to be able to participate and contribute to the carbon reductions that we need. Um, and finally, a portfolio approach, you know, all the vehicles that I mentioned, whether they be hybrid electric, plug-in hybrid electric, battery electric, uh, and even fuel cell to an extent, they all have batteries, and they all have electric motors, and they all have power electronics to manage it all. And so by having more vehicles that have this type of technology on it, we're developing more of the industrial base, we're producing more battery, we're producing more motors, and so forth. So just to wind up, um, clearly achieving these kinds of goals um, isn't easy, and it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it requires the sustained and collective efforts of uh, all of us here in this room, automakers, uh, our dealers, and our suppliers, uh, the utilities, the grid operators, and the infrastructure providers, and of course, both the federal and the, the important role of the state governments. We need to work together like never before. We need to develop new supply chains, new manufacturing capabilities, new infrastructure, clearly, an entirely new way for customers to think about how they refuel their vehicles uh, and how they use them. So where do they refuel them? When do they refuel them? How long will it take? And what's it going to cost? We know these answers for gasoline, right? Uh, where? Wherever the heck you want. <laughs> when? Whenever the heck you want. And how long? About three to five minutes, right? So th there's some substantial changes. And what's the cost? Well, gasoline prices, of course, vary, but it costs the same at eight in the morning as it does at two in the morning and at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, not necessarily the case for electricity. So there's just a, a lot of education as well that needs to go into this transition um, and getting consumers used to a new way of thinking about how they travel. But you know, despite those challenges, I mean, I think what I'm here to say today is we're here to help work on those challenges, uh, to work with the states on uh, trying to overcome these barriers. Uh, the consumer demand is changing, and uh, let's catch that wave. You know, let's work together to build upon that uh, change in direction that we're seeing. And uh, we look forward to working with uh, many of you in this room, if not all of you in this room, uh, as we make this transition. And thanks for the microphone. I can do a bit of kind of microphone activity here. Maybe. That's the mic. Is this a little better? It feels a little better. Uh, uh, government, Governor McMaster and Governor Cooper, uh, Governor Brucci, uh, happy to be here. It's a really important topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, General Motors believes in a world of zero emissions. Um, we've been accelerating into this uh, battery electric future for some time now. Um, we have laid out very clear plans to be carbon neutral by 2040. That's both in our product, our battery electric vehicle products, um, and our operations. Uh, we have laid out clear plans to get to uh, zero tailpipe emissions by 2020, uh, 2035 in all of our new vehicles. We've invested from a product portfolio point of view $35 billion in electric and autonomous vehicles that we will deploy here by 2025. Uh, That'll be a total of 30 electric vehicles, both uh, luxury, uh, mid-range, uh, affordable vehicles, um, you know, less than $30,000 uh, in um, all types of portfolio entries. We've also announced a specific $750 million uh, dedicated, very targeted towards EV infrastructure. Uh, we've been doing EV infrastructure activities here for several years now. We understand this in extreme details. We've got research, we've got application information, and there are defined 
problem statements that customers run into and our $750 million that we've allocated to um, infrastructure development is very clearly laid out towards home charging activities, public community charging activities, and highway DC fast charger infrastructure. Uh, our community dealer uh, program is gonna lay out 40,000 level two charges in our um, public community areas uh, that we'll be looking forward to working with uh, here as we've started to roll that out already. 90% uh, of the US population lives within 10 miles of a, of a General Motors dealership in some way uh, that we'll be working for. These, these charges, by the way, are not at dealerships. They're spread throughout the community, uh, specifically outside of our dealerships. Uh, and we have programs to cover DC fast charges on the 47,000 miles of highway infrastructure spread throughout the US. Uh, we also have invested a further $25 million in a climate equity fund to look specifically at closing the equity gaps as we transition to electric vehicles and sustainable solutions for low equity uh, house, uh, communities. So we're doing our part to drive a US leadership position in electrification. We're trying to tackle the most difficult problems in a methodical way. Uh, this means we're going to dramatically improve choice, affordability, accessibility of millions of people uh, throughout the American uh, areas and workforce. Just this week, actually, with Governor Whitmer, uh, we announced a $7 billion investment in Michigan for an all-electric future and additional 5,000 jobs as part of that investment. Um, that investment covers uh, four billion uh, in the Orion Township area to convert what was a traditional internal combustion engine plant to an electric vehicle plant. Uh, it includes uh, joint venture partners with LG Energy Solutions to build yet another Altium cell uh, plant. This will be our third plant. Another 2.5 billion in that third plant near Lansing. It's a great investment. And as we continue to adopt more EVs, uh, we continue to look for the next site to put our, um, our next um, cell plant into. That would be our fourth plant. So based on our research uh, about infrastructure programs around home, public community charging and road trip activity, we have very clear um, problem statements laid out for each one. And we know, we think we know how to fix these problem statements for our uh, customers and our uh, constituents that would fix, around, fix problems around adoption, infrastructure, installation, um, accessibility. And we look forward to having dialogue with the states, our partners, um, to address uh, these problems at the fastest rate we possibly can. So um, we might get time to talk about the specific problems here in a minute, but we look forward to working with you on those. Thank you very much, uh, Governor McMaster, Governor Cooper, Governor Bashir, and governors on the panel. Thanks so much for having us. Uh, Alliance for Automotive Innovation uh, represents virtually every car manufacturer that produces and sells in the US market here today, as well as suppliers, tech companies, and new entrants to the mobility space. So we look at the infrastructure question and the automotive ecosystem broadly um, as we have conversations like this one. There are two things happening. One, there is a market transformation. We're shifting from an internal combustion engine vehicle market to an electrified vehicle market. There's also an industrial transformation. We are transforming the automotive industrial base from a strictly internal combustion engine base to one that includes the development of electrified vehicles. Both of those transformations are enormous and extraordinary. And they require a, a degree of cooperation and engagement and a broader strategy that will be important and will determine how quickly this transformation happens and to what degree it benefits American workers and it benefits American consumers. That's what's at stake today. Um, with regard to the market transformation, a lot of this is gonna be about the question of infrastructure. But to put Tom's and Travis's comments in uh, context for a second, the industry as a whole will spend $330 billion on electrification by 2025. Even here in Washington, that's real money. Secondly, Today, 
there are about 60 separate individual vehicles in the marketplace that are electrified vehicles, that are battery electric vehicles, or plug-in hybrid vehicles, or hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. By 2025, that number will be 130. So you're seeing leadership, you're seeing demand increase. And so the question now is, will infrastructure keep up? Will we have an opportunity to make sure uh, that the customers that are buying these vehicles are happy customers and that they're satisfied customers? Um, the, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, IIJA, uh, was a imp critically important first step um, in providing funds for charging infrastructure, public charging infrastructure. $5 billion of that will be for fast charging on highway quarters. This is critically important. As an EV driver, driving around town here in DC, not too hard. Getting from here north or south to say Connecticut or to the Outer Banks or from here to Michigan, that's a, that's a whole different question. And so we need to start to make sure that we're working together uh, to build out infrastructure. One, I think, idea that I, I hope that you're looking at, and I'm sure as governors you already are, is that as that money flows in to your states, that there is cooperation between your departments of transportation as well as your departments of energy and environment and your public utility commissions to ensure that those dollars are deployed in a way that supports infrastructure in the right place for the broadest number of people and ensures that people are you know, able to charge their vehicles in a timely fashion. So I think that's an important you know, idea and I'm sure you're already looking at that. Um, we've laid out a whole series of attributes that we think charging stations should have that really promote efficiency, uh, that are effective, and that are equitable for consumers. I want to talk quickly about the industrial-based transformation. We talk a lot about the EV supply chain. I want to talk about the EV employment chain. We have an opportunity to employ more Americans right now, yes, and in the investments that you've heard from Travis and General Motors, and yes, from Tom at Toyota and other companies. But think about what that also enables. It enables new jobs in the utility sector as new transformers are developed and as grid resiliency uh, becomes more important. Renewable energy jobs are created because the EV fleet is as clean as the energy that charges it. Um, there is a whole new industry in the development of the charging equipment, um, where it's sited, how it's permitted, and how it's actually manufactured, as well as the development of charging stations and a whole question about battery recycling and reuse as we go forward. All of these are new employment opportunities that I believe create tremendous opportunities for states around the country. One last point. There are other important, necessary, I would call them required conditions if this is going to be successful. Um, yes, more infrastructure development. And I think Tom and Travis have some really good and smart ideas there. Um, we have to make sure that we are providing access uh, and uh, awareness about these products early in their development cycle while the market is still small. Uh, and so, yes, uh, targeted incentives can be helpful in key areas. We need to make sure that we're updating building codes. Uh, it's helpful when fleets, including state fleets, lead by example. Uh, and let's make it sure that we continue to evaluate the resiliency and effectiveness of the electrical grid as we build these out. So those are some additional thoughts and some ideas that I think we can further dialogue on. And so with that, I want to thank you again for having us here today. Uh, that was an enlightening conversation. We're now going to have some questions for from governors, and I think Governor McMaster, were you going to start off with the first? Sorry, you're going to start off with the first question here. Yes, I will start off first. How about this? Yeah, okay. Well, congratulations, to Governor Cooper and Governor Whitmer, on the the new facilities. Uh, in the economic development, fierce competition between the states, that's known as catching a big fish. We congratulate you and want to know how you did it. Uh, I want to encourage, we go, the, the governors, of course, will, will ask questions and 
I'd encourage the audience, if you have a good question, just sing out and, and remember the only, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. And we're trying to be informal and move fast. So, so uh, we thank you, gentlemen. My question, uh, Travis, I think you mentioned earlier about future-proofing this, this whole industry. It's coming so fast, faster, maybe faster than, than others we've seen before. Uh, could you give us some context or some views on how we're going to future proof this so what we do on Monday is not outdated by Sunday? Yeah, that's it. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, so, if you look at our 750 million that we talked about uh, installing for charge infrastructure, there are four specific areas that we think um, need to be addressed. We have done tremendous amounts of research. We have installed lots of charging, both public level two DC fast charging. And I guess I'd offer, um, I'd offer the four areas, I'll just quickly run through them here and, I'll, and I will include your future-proofing uh, answer in there. So the first one would be with respect to home charging and that is to do with permitting. So we know that 85% of EV owners charge at home. That's their number one way that they charge their vehicle. We also know that permitting is controlled at a municipality level with hugely varying results. So GM has installed over 3,000 free charges in, in people's homes and the data is quite compelling. The permitting process varies from um, one day through to 110 days to get a permit in that home. And the average, when you look at the state by state averages, ranges typically from 20 days to 60 days uh, to get that permit through. And if you think of an EV owner who buys their brand new product, they've taken this step into a new future and they go home and they can't charge because they can't get the permit. We track um, people who you know, move from EV back to an internal combustion engine. This is one of their key drivers for that is they can't get their home charger installed. So we would propose that um, states create a clear, simple, standardized, important standardized permitting process uh, for all EV charger installations that would override what the municipality process is, that would help, that would be our biggest help in EV adoption that is there. Um, the second thing would be a kilowatt hour charging approach. This, this would fix a problem that is starting to grow quite significantly in community public charging areas. Today's CPOs, charge point operators, they interpret um, state um, state utility regulatory commission guidelines to be able to, to, they interpret this to charge their customers at a time-based activity, not a hours per kilowatt uh, usage capability. What that means, and, and when you look at how a vehicle works, a vehicle doesn't charge at the same rate linearly through the charging range. The first 10 minutes sucks a lot more kilowatts of energy compared to the last 10 minutes. So if you're charging at a steady rate based on time, you are charging customers more than they need to pay. Um, so going from in changing the rules and mandating, if we would propose to the states to mandate a per kilowatt hour payment basis, not a time-based basis. This helps with um, affordability, particularly um, for people who don't have their own garage, maybe live in a uh, multi-unit dwelling environment, um, apartments, and who have to use public charging. Building codes is a really the third one. This is important for home, office, and par parking structure areas. So uh, there are a small number of cities who have started to do this, but pre-wiring for level two charging installations uh, in any new building being established is a very foundational and easy thing to do. Um, just so you all have context, the pre-wiring for a level two charger is about the same as what you would put in a, a home or an office or something for a, like a normal clothes dryer. That's the same type of regulations and requirements. But we need to mandate how to get them into um, future um, structures that are being built. And the last one here, number four, is freeway infrastructure mandates. Um, these are the ones that allow people to do r road trip charging. And you know, typically, state of the art at the moment is around like a 350 kilowatt DC ch fast charger. It's going to get to megawatt charging here in the not too distant future. Um, but we would propose that states mandate the use and the, um, the funding money that has become available 
to incentivise um, minimum levels of DC fast charge infrastructure uh, across uh, anything that is near a freeway dwell location. So not just limited to gas stations, but think of rest stops, food stops and other things. Uh, delivery of electricity is pretty easy now and it's a lot safer than digging holes and putting gasoline under the ground and, and running pumps. So you can do this. Um, many other places around the world have done this and it's a really great way to do it. Uh, those four things would it would speed up adoption of electric vehicles much more than uh, anything else that we've seen in our um, activity. And Governor McMaster, to your future proofing question, a lot of if you think about a DC fast charger being installed next, you know, near a freeway, right now it's a 350 kilowatt charger is what people would put in. Previously that would have been a 50 kilowatt charger, and in the future it'll be much more than 350 kilowatts as we learn how as an industry to deliver energy and receive energy into that vehicle. But a lot of the infrastructure costs are to do with the trenching, the type of um, uh, wiring that runs to that charger, how we set that up. And if we build that for more than 350 at the start, knowing that when we switch the charger over, that's a relatively simple exercise to do, we can prepare not only for now, but there's several um, companies and OEMs who are working way beyond 350 because ultimately what we are after is customer convenience. We need to be able to deliver energy into that vehicle in that same three to five minutes that Tom talked about a little earlier uh, so people can get off with their lives and do whatever they want. So that would be that's kind of how we look at it at the moment based on our experiences over the last 10 years. Great. Other governors have questions. I don't know if Governor Brashear is still on. Okay, other go uh, Governor Mills. Thanks. Thank you. In Maine, uh, we we manufacture computer chips. We're very proud of uh, uh, the production that we offer in Maine. But I'm told, and I remember that the president, in a speech a year about a year ago, talked about supply chain silicon, lithium products, and uh, how China still seems to have a corner on the market on computer chips of a certain size that go into, for instance, electric vehicles. And I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Is that still an issue? What are your supply chain issues with respect to manufacture of uh, electric vehicles? Yes, uh, Governor Mills, thanks for, the, thanks for the question. I'll start, and I'm sure Travis and Tom will build on it. Um, the shortage of... Um, mature nodes of automotive semiconductors is still a critical shortage for the industry. There is just no question about that. If you look at dealer lots across the country, and I'm sure this is true in Maine, you'll see uh, uh, historically low levels of inventory. Uh, and the, re the reason for that is a shortage of the types of computer chips that are really required uh, to work all the time, every time at minus 40 degrees, <laughs> in Maine, as well as 120 degrees Fahrenheit in Arizona in the summer. Uh, and so those mature nodes are still significantly short. Um, and, and we're working through that. Um, but I think it, your question is a broader one, and I think it's an excellent one, which is, is this in some ways a preview of coming attractions as we look at the EV supply chain and we think about uh, critical minerals, and we think about the processing of those critical minerals, and we think about the developments um, of components that go into EVs. Um, certainly other regions of the world are showing leadership in this area. Um, but that does not have to be our future. Uh, and that is why it's really important that we continue to look at this question, not only from the, the customer back, but from the mine head forward. And so we need to be looking at opportunities to mine raw materials here in the United States. We need to look at opportunities to process raw materials here in the United States. We're already seeing uh, Congress working together uh, with the U.S. Commerce Department to um, cite now the production of semiconductor uh, uh, manufacturing here in the United States. All of those things can and should be done to ensure that this transformation benefits American workers and American consumers. So yes, it's a question, but I think there's a lot of good work being done um, to make sure that we show leadership going forward. Sorry. 
uh, yeah, I think Travis also wants to follow up, so I'll just keep this short. Uh, obviously, agree with with uh, everything John said and articulates so well. Uh, the chip crisis is, you know, sort of continuing, and and obviously the concern with uh, additional concern outside of chips alone is with the raw materials, of course, for the batteries and uh, the the precious metals that need to go into them. And you know, whether uh, cl clearly you want to have uh, supplies closer to home to the extent possible, but but also relying on a single source of supply in any scenario is risky, as we've seen with the current um, chip crisis. So. Uh, I think we also need to think about, you know, a, a resiliency in the supply chain, uh, both here and potentially, you know, more from kind of a macro level view uh, for the for the different raw materials. And a, and a key element, I think, on the battery side is going to be how we manage the recovery, uh, recycling, and reuse of the batteries. The reuse doesn't really kind of help with the new vehicles per se if you're using them for stationary operations or some other kind of power in their second life. But certainly the uh, recovery of materials through the recycling process so that you're relying less on new uh, production to, uh, to get those into the market is, is really critical as well. Yeah, look, it's a great question. I, I think about it in two ways. Uh, I think about it now relative to um, supply chain activities. And as you go from, uh, you know, General Motors has been very clear that we have a quite a vertical integration plan for the present time. So, you know, PACs, cell module assemblies, cell production, chemistries, and and how we then get those raw materials, you know, whether it's lithium ion, nickel, silicon content, and what percentage of those are going to be there. Then you go below that into the raw material supply chain and the extraction of those materials. And then you get into recyclability, which can offset some of the raw materials you need to build up. We, we're very, we've learned from the chip activities over the last two years to be very controlling and deep into that supply chain. So I think there's a part of me thinks about that path and GM has a strategy that's very clear and deliberate through that part. But then you get into, well, where does the future go on this? And we always have to keep an eye on the future because our chemistries even two years ago um, are not the same as they were six months ago and now they won't be that you know in the future here. And as we move and change the sort of known percentages of those batteries, and then we get into solid state batteries, that supply chain is gonna move and we have to be dealing with not only controlling your current integration, but where we're we moving here in the future. And we spend a lot of time on that. And I think um, it's a really important part because we never wanna get caught up into a chip supply style issue into our batteries and trust us, we are looking at that very closely. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll get it. Yeah, sure. It'll be a comment and, a, and an ask. Uh, actually, in Puerto Rico, about four and a half years ago, we were we got hit by a devastating hurricane, Hurricane Maria, which decimated our electrical grid. FEMA spent uh, several billion dollars in the last couple of years fixing the grid, but it basic repairs. Now, we have about $10 billion worth of FEMA funding to actually rebuild, rebuild the grid, make it re reliable, resilient. Um, and as we speak, we, were, we have an independent energy regulator now in Puerto Rico. It's like a, we, we're, we're in the midst of an energy transformation for other reasons. And they're about, they're studying ways in which we can do this EC infrastructure having. Uh, as well as making sure that our grid and our generation assets can take it, can take this additional demand that is forthcoming. Uh, so that's the comment. The ask is, it would be great if all of you, meaning the Alliance, General Motors, Toyota, advise us, you know, give our energy regulator, I'll make sure that you get connected because we're in the midst of, you know, using all this federal money. So we might as well use it smartly and incorporate the right technology um, in doing so. Thank you. I think for Puerto Rico specifically, you have a very unique opportunity to do something special. Um, it, it would be separate for what I would recommend for the rest of the country, but between you know, a stable grid 
um, in that area, you can get into stationary storage solutions. You can get into, you know, we're deep in hydrotech fuel cells. So I, that can give you resiliency beyond what you've ever had before on um, on some of the gas line areas and other, air, um, and other um, forms of electricity generation. You can get into microgrids, which are self-sustainable. You know, we do these now for companies, but there's no reason why you couldn't do it for something the size of Puerto Rico. There's, there's really smart solutions that exist now that haven't really been there in the past. So use it smart. You can do some great things. We'd be happy to give some guidance too. Yeah, just did a Travis's team and my team can get on the same plane maybe down there. <laughs> we, we, we've been talking to our, uh, our, our sales operations down there about renewable options for the, for the facility down there as well. Uh, because they're not only not only do they sell cars, but they're an integral part of the community. And um, during that hurricane, for example, I think uh, we were able to use our sales headquarters as a shelter, and and I'm sure other other companies do the same thing. But we're not necessarily unique in that area. But we've been looking specifically at uh, different kinds of uh, options in the space. So I'd love to get on the plane with you and go down there. Yeah, uh, I will jump on that plane with you guys too. I'd love to come <laughs> visit Puerto Rico. Uh, just a couple comments. Uh, so Oklahoma has been a pioneer in everything energy for, uh, you know, over a century. And so, uh, one thing that people don't realize about Oklahoma, we're super proud of our oil and gas industry. Number six, uh, producer of oil in the entire country, number four, natural gas. But something that surprises people, we're actually number two in wind energy production. Uh, one of only four States that over 40% of our uh, energy comes from renewables. We're a net exporter to the Southwest Power Pool that we're a part of. And we've done that. We're just kind of an all of the above approach. So we want to go where the puck is heading. And I've been instructing my commerce department to focus on electric vehicles because we believe exactly like you guys have so elegantly said is that uh, uh, that's where everybody's heading right now. So um, we just landed Canoe, which is a new upstart, uh, building a 2,000 person employee. Uh, factory in eastern Oklahoma. Uh, we're in on a couple big battery uh, choices and some of the uh, some other manufacturing opportunities. So uh, really excited about that. But I guess my question is, um, you know, the, the mining stuff is super important, how we transition that uh, back to the U.S. and some of our friends. But uh, really my question is, you know, how do states, how do you think that states are going to, as we move to electric vehicles, how are we going to fund our roads, our bridges, as we move kind of either a tax structure away from uh, at the pump back to electric vehicles? That's something that um, I think is interesting for all the governors to kind of be contemplating as we move forward in the next couple decades. John, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Um, so uh, thank you, Governor Stiff, for the question and, and for the Gretzky reference, the Wayne Gretzky reference there. Um, so uh, <laughs> all right, um, I, I'll help you, Tom. So th look, th this is a critical question, and it's a critical question for two reasons. One is that the fleet of Gasoline-powered vehicles is getting more efficient all the time. So even before you get to the EV transformation, you're losing revenues, right? Because th just it fleets more efficient. Then you start to you know add in electric vehicles, and so it's an important question. I think there are a couple of things. One is that I think that you know when you think about EVs, you know EVs should pay their share as long as it's a fair share or a comparable share. So, you know, roughly the same amount of money that, you know, a gasoline-powered consumer would pay in your state, given gas taxes, right? So I do think there's a role. There, there's something you can do there, as long as it's not so expensive that it, st it that's, that stops the sale of electric vehicles, right? So I think that's certainly one thing you, you would look, look at. I think the second thing is, and we're seeing states experiment with this already, right? How to think about new models, whether they are, you know, so it's moving away from paying at the pump. Um, we are happy to talk to states about those different ideas. I think, frankly, this is one of those examples where states truly are the laboratories of democracy because, you know, again, there are, you know, experiments taking place um, all around the country on this. But I do think it's, 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 a very, it's a very big question. We're not gonna be able to, I don't think, fund roads in the future um, the way you know, we're funding them today. The last point I'd make is that when we think about 
vehicle and infra road infrastructure, we need to think about it not only in the way that, say, um, Secretary Buttigieg talked about it with regard to the actual material that's being used to pay the, pave the roads, but we also need to think about it from a smart infrastructure perspective, the types of infrastructure to enable safer, more automated vehicles, uh, the type of infrastructure that will enable uh, electric vehicles, whether it's charging infrastructure or other infrastructure in the roads that will enable electric electrification. So I, I think we're going to have to work together to think about how to fund this differently. But in the near term, I think as you're looking at EVs and what share they should pay, let's make that make sure that share is comparable. I've got one, one more. Sure. Uh, thanks. I just uh, really wanted to ask a, a quick question about hydrogen fuel cells and fuel cells in in the um, passenger vehicle and whether you and there are some very rural areas that it just seems like the economics of um, a battery just doesn't work out and the future of uh, hydrogen fuel cells and um, you know whether there might be specific applications that make it workable. Sounds like, sounds like we're short on time, so I'll go real quick and then I'll pass it on to Tom. Uh, we are a huge uh, supporter of hydrogen fuel cells um, for the right application. I think, you know, a normal sized light duty vehicle doesn't need hydrogen to be efficient, to do everything that it needs to do for the consumer who wants to use it. As you get up into class eight trucks or medium duty trucks and other things, that's where a hydrogen fuel cell makes sense. And um, you know that'll be another frontier that we get into pretty soon here. There's some examples of those around and uh, they're quite viable. They make a lot of sense and they're a much more sustainable way for us to you know, achieve commerce around the country. So uh, we're very pro on it. Yeah, thanks Travis. Um, it's no secret Toyota is pretty bullish on hydrogen and fuel cells and uh, certainly for the heavy duty market, as, as Travis mentioned, we've got a, a number of uh, projects going on and, uh, and business development going on in terms of uh, fuel cell powertrain um, supply to the heavy duty industry. We're working in the ports of LA and Long Beach, for example, on uh, dredge truck uh, hydrogen projects. And um, you know, not only is it a great environmental justice um, Project. I mean, it, it takes not only the, the carbon out of the air, but it takes all of the other diesel emissions out of the air. And those ports are often located, of course, in areas um, disadvantaged communities. Um, you can see the the uh, science scientific papers that have been done around the ports, just like the the you know the color coded like the snowfall amounts. It's like the the NOx and the uh, the carcinogen amounts are just you know fire fire red around the port areas. So there's huge benefits in uh, in these areas, and and we're you know, looking to uh, figure out how we can leverage those fuel cells because a lot of those uh, trucks, you know, the drainage trucks, they come 30 miles, 40 miles each way, multiple times a day, refueling at the same place. Uh, we're we still have our oar in the water on on the light duty vehicle side as well. Of course, we sell the, the Toyota Mirai out in California, and um, you know the the great thing about the technology is from a consumer point of view, it's that three to five minute refuel. And yes, the infrastructure is a challenge, and, and we've been investing a lot in that space uh, to ensure reliability and, and uh, continued supply out in California. But um, that's really the attractiveness, uh, in addition to, of course, the fact that it only puts out water. Um, and, and by the way, hydrogen can be used for some of these other um, power sources as a storage medium. You know, we talked about Puerto Rico and, and what might uh, work there in terms of uh, the ability to store off-peak renewables, produce hydrogen, use that as a storage medium. Of course, batteries can be used for that as well. But uh, So there's definitely a, a role to play and uh, look forward to uh, talking more to you if you'd like. Thank you. I don't have a question, but if we have time, if we have one good question from the audience, we'd be glad to, glad to hear it. Anybody chomping in a bit? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Governor's panels, fantastic discussion. I'm Scotty Greenwood. Uh, I'm here representing the Ontario Premier. Uh, 
Council on U.S. Trade and Competitiveness in parts of Ontario, actually south of Michigan, so we have something in common with the Southern Governors. Uh, but wonderful <laughs> discussion. Uh, can't, this isn't my question, but when you think about the, um, the Gov Governor Mills question on critical minerals and supply chain, Canada has a lot to offer there uh, right next to the United States. But my question on electric vehicles, if I might, um, for the panel and the governors is when you look at federal incentives, U.S. federal incentives for electric vehicles, there's one provision that's being hotly debated um, that has to do with tax incentives um, for consumers to purchase electric vehicles, and it has to be unionized labor, and it has to be made in the United States. And I, and I just wonder how you think about those kind of provisions um, when we think about how integrated the United States and Canada are, particularly since the 1965 auto pact, we make these vehicles together. General Mills has a couple billion dollar EV investment in Canada as an example. General Mills, also General Motors. <laughs> uh, Mills is the food. Anyway, I just wonder how the, how the group thinks about those kinds of provisions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take that question and I'll be brief because I know we're at the end. Uh, I do think that consumer incentives are very important still at this stage in the game. Um, while we're still at very low levels of EV penetration, right at four percent, um, eventually you'll see uh, those type that type of support for those sales phase out as we get to much higher levels uh, of EV penetration. But they're important now. To your question about the policy design, what the certain what the elements are, obviously that is something that's being debated in Congress. I think as a general matter, you know, our view as an industry that the incentives should be broadly applied. They should, uh, they should affect as many vehicles or provide opportunities for consumers to buy as many vehicles as possible. Uh, and they should be non-discriminatory if that's possible. And so, you know, that's the general idea, but it's going to really up to be up to Congress ultimately to figure out what the policy elements are. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, ladies. Uh, we've reached the end. Governor Bashir, thank you. Does Governor Bashir have something to say before we close out? Hearing nothing, we are in adjournment.